I don't know what to say to her. There are other worries. Dan had no insurance and Kelly has no job. But at the moment, yeah, that all seems short, so trivial after all that she's seen. And I caught the plane going into the building. And that's all the first night I could think about was I could picture him on it. I don't know how he, if he knew anything or what, but. Um. An image, she says, that will stay with her forever and ever. Ann McDermott, CNN, Los Angeles. Well, CNN's continuing coverage of America's new war continues in a moment we'll see again at 10 o'clock tonight. President Bush delivers his strongest words yet about the U.S. response to Tuesday's terrorist attacks. I'm Wolf Blitzer in Washington. And I'm Joey Chen at CNN Center in Atlanta. We want to begin by updating you on the day's developments. President Bush called Osama bin Laden the, quote, prime suspect in Tuesday's attacks, repeating a pledge that the United States will respond. We're at war. There's been an act of war declared upon America by terrorists, and we will respond accordingly. And I appreciate very much the, the American people understanding that. As we plan, as we put, uh, uh, put our um, strategy into action, uh, we will let you know when we think it's appropriate, uh, not only for, uh, uh, to, to, to uh, protect the lives of our uh, servicemen and women, but to make sure our coalition has had proper time to be noticed as well. But we're going to act. On the investigative front, CNN has learned that two hijackers aboard the plane that crashed into the Pentagon were being watched by U.S. intelligence because of an alleged connection to the attack on the USS Cole off Yemen last October. Meantime, the INS has detained 25 individuals on possible immigration violations. Among them, two men who authorities say were carrying box cutters aboard a Newark to to San Antonio flight that was diverted Tuesday after the four hijackings unfolded. The flight data and cockpit voice recorders have been recovered from the Pentagon and the Pennsylvania crash sites, but not from the World Trade Center. Round the clock search and rescue efforts continue at ground zero in lower Manhattan. New York's police commissioner says the death toll stands at 152 with nearly 5,000 people still missing. Firefighters laid to rest three of their own today, including Reverend Michael Judge, a fire department chaplain who was delivering last rites to a firefighter killed in the attack on the first tower. Reverend Judge was killed in the crush of the second tower's collapse. And Continental Airlines, citing an industry slowdown resulting from the terror attacks, announced today that it's furloughing some 12,000 employees. Continental CEO is making an urgent appeal to Congress to keep the airline industry afloat. A measure that would have provided two and a half billion dollars to the airline industry was defeated today in the House of Representatives. Joey. All right, as you have just heard, the language coming from President Bush is anything but subtle. CNN's Kelly Wallace is following the commander in chief and joins us now live with the latest out there. Kelly. Well, Joey, definitely the toughest talk yet from President Bush since Tuesday's deadly terrorist attacks. The president appears to be trying to do a couple of things. Number one, sending a message to U.S. troops and to the American people to get ready for what could be a long-term military campaign, but also knowing that the American people are angry and hungry for some swift retaliatory attack. The president also saying that Americans should be patient, that his response will come in time. Now, President Bush started his day 
getting his normal national security briefings and then having a three-hour meeting with his national security team. As you can see, also at that meeting, of course, Vice President Dick Cheney. The Vice President has been spending the past couple of days up at Camp David after the Secret Service determined, based on security concerns, that it would be best not to have the President and the Vice President in the same place. Before that meeting got underway, Mr. Bush talking at length with reporters. He said that the U.S. will get the terrorists, those responsible for these deadly attacks, no matter what it takes. They will try to hide. They will try to uh, avoid the United States and our allies. But we're not going to let them. They, uh, they run to the hills. They find holes to get in. And we will do whatever it takes to smoke them out and get them running, and we'll get them. And when asked if the president's words are a way for him to start laying the groundwork for using ground troops to attack terrorists and those who harbor them, the president's spokesman, Ari Fleischer, saying that nothing has been ruled out. Now, Mr. Bush is expected to have dinner this evening with members of his national security team and then have more meetings on Sunday. The president also expected to keep working the phones. He spoke with the leaders of Spain and Mexico today. Also, Judy, uh, Joey, excuse me, Secretary of State Colin Powell confirming what CNN has been reporting since yesterday that the Pakistanis have agreed to fully cooperate with U.S. requests. And the U.S., according to sources, has asked the Pakistanis to allow U.S. planes to use Pakistani or fly over Pakistani airspace if the U.S. determines and decides to take any military action. Joey, back to you. Kelly, uh, does the president have any further plans to, uh, we have seen him a couple times this week speaking directly to the American public, has he any other plans for another sort of formal address given the developments over the last couple days? Not at this time. You know, the president's schedule, we're really uh, not getting details basically just learning about his events as they happen. The president did talk directly to the American people in his radio address today, another time where he was basically calling on Americans to be patient and laying out the case for what he plans to do. Again, we don't have word about his schedule, but you can expect that this president will continue to go before the American people because he knows that there's tremendous support right now for some military response, but keeping up that support will definitely be a bigger and bigger challenge the more time goes on, and Joey, of course, a bigger challenge too, if, if any prolonged military attack involves some U.S. troops losing their lives. So expect to see the president going before the American people to continue to uh, explain what he plans to do and obviously definitely to go before the American people once any action is taken. Shall we? CNN White House correspondent Kelly Wall is joining us in traveling with the president today. Wall. Joey, by calling up more than 50,000 reservists for what's described as, quote, homeland defense, President Bush has already taken a key step toward mobilizing the United States military. CNN's Jamie McIntyre joins us now from the Pentagon with the latest on that front. Jamie, what's going on today? Well, some of those reservists may be getting their notices within the la uh, next couple of days. In fact, some reservists have already been called up, some Coast Guard reservists, to begin uh, increasing patrols along, along America's coast. This phrase you're going to be hearing now, homeland defense, is something that the United States is going to be putting more emphasis on. Uh, up until now, uh, war hasn't touched uh, U.S. soil uh, uh, in this century or in, even in the last century, but uh, there is going to be a much greater emphasis on uh, increasing security and protecting the United States. At the same time, uh, here at the Pentagon, uh, the Pentagon is not just an uh, office space for Pentagon workers, it's also a symbol of the U.S. military and the uh, arsenals of democracy. Because of that, it's very important that this historic building be rebuilt, according to Pentagon officials, and today they announced uh, that the first contracts had been let uh, to begin the rebuilding process as soon as all of the remains have been cleared away and the building has been uh, sh shored up. They released some video uh, today showing the inside of the building, the, uh, the devastating damage where 189 people died, 64 of them on that uh, airplane. Um, they will have to renovate about 4 million square feet of this building and remove about 350 million pounds of debris before they can start rebuilding the building. They'll have to strip it down to the columns, uh, but they do say they will get that done within a couple of years uh, and that they will have that wedge of the Pentagon uh, uh, back in business as soon as it is possible.
Wolf? Jamie, as you know, the Pentagon has been undergoing a massive renovation uh, that's going to supposedly take many years. Uh, is this going to set back the overall plan to uh, rebuild the Pentagon? Well, that, that remains to be seen. I mean, obviously, it is a setback. The Pentagon was supposed to be renovated entirely by 2012. And in fact, this area had just, the renovations had just been completed, and they were about to move to the next wedge of the building. The Pentagon is divided into five wedges. Now they're going to be uh, rebuilding that wedge while they, uh, uh, the, the new wedge that had just been re refurbished along with the second one. And uh, they'll be putting a lot of effort into doing that still within the same time, overall time frame. But uh, the commitment here is to put the building back together in better shape than it was originally, restoring its original uh, limestone facade and incorporating the latest in security features, blast-proof windows, uh, fire retardant walls and sprinkler systems. All of the features they say that in the newly renovated wedge of the Pentagon helped to save a lot of lives uh, and that this death toll uh, of 126 people in the building or 125 people in the building who were killed uh, would have been much higher had they not had some of those new security features in that part of the building. And Jamie, getting back to the report uh, that you've been giving us about the call up of the reserves of the National Guard, well, what about calling up additional reservists and National Guard troops if in fact an offensive military plan is formulated and begins to go into operation? Any indication uh, at all about uh, plans uh, going forward on that front? Well, Pentagon officials are downplaying the idea that there's going to be any imminent military action and any imminent additional call-up of reserves, but they say that that certainly is an option down the road. Now, part of the emphasis of this administration and Pentagon is to keep secret things secret. They want to try to uh, keep as much operational security as possible about their future plans, uh, and so it's, it's going to be a little difficult to figure out, and we may not even want to report on what it is they ha have in mind. But at this point, there's no indication of imminent military action. If the U.S. were to launch uh, some large-scale operation, it would ine inevitably result in the call-up of more reserves because the way the military is organized these days, it depends on the reserves for, for many key job specialties. Jamie McIntyre, our military affairs correspondent at the Pentagon, thank you very much. Back to you, Joey. Well, if you can see the operation underway at this hour in Lower Manhattan, take a look at the picture, a live picture from Lower Manhattan at this hour as the work continues, the desperate effort to find any remaining survivors at the World Trade Center site. Unfortunately, we are sorry to report to you today that the number of missing has tragically grown. CNN's Richard Roth is following now from our overview vantage point in Lower Manhattan with the latest on the rescue efforts. Richard. Overview of ground zero, and sadly, the number of missing unaccounted for has grown to 4,972. Uh, that's about 200 higher than uh, the total since this disaster uh, erupted. Uh, officials explain the count went up uh, due to missing person out of town reports filed uh, outside of uh, New York City and Manhattan, and more relatives trickling into New York City crisis centers. Authorities say 152 bodies have been pulled so far from the rubble, 18 of them. Uh, firefighters and uh, more than 100 hours, more 100, uh, excuse me, uh, yeah, 100 hours, more than four days after the uh, planes hit the towers, uh, there's really been no significant uh, uh, discovery of uh, survivors, no pings, no knocks, uh, no cries, just tons of wreckage coming up, and that's what they've been working on in uh, assembly lines, uh, chains, hands clawing in there trying to get uh, whatever they can out and then the trucks take it to uh, take a lot of the debris to Staten Island the bodies are taken away also the workers have got a boost from the visit of uh, President Bush yesterday but still uh, haven't given up hope yet uh, some think there are some pockets where people could be uh, areas that have almost relatively remained untouched uh, reported CNN's Marty Savage an hour ago uh, but they still haven't found uh, any survivors uh, now, a minor part of the story, though, of course, the, those that have survived, the people who lived in the neighborhood and on the Lower East Side of Manhattan and the Tribeca area, uh, downtown New York City, uh, those people are there, but also the financial center. In the financial district, they were test done on the computer, the utility lines, workers swarmed in. New York Stock Exchange Chairman Richard Grasso says all systems are go for an opening of the stock market on 930 on Monday morning. Uh, Instead, the worker, the traders are going to pause for two minutes before the uh, trading goes on uh, to honor those killed. Everyone will be singing "God Bless America," and instead of corporate executives or even Michael Jackson, boy, doesn't that seem like a long time ago when he rang, uh, or so to speak, the Nasdaq uh, 
start of the market a week ago or so. Uh, it'll be rescue workers. Various agency heads will ring the opening bell of the New York Stock Exchange. Richard Grasso, the head of the exchange, asked traders to use and take time and reason for the decisions involving their transactions starting on Monday. Also returning will be uh, those who live in the area. Uh, and they went back. Some of them were given only 10 minutes of time uh, to get into their homes and check their belongings, check their pets. Some 25,000 people live in the area. Uh, New York City police, though, have had to deal with a lot of tourists and onlookers, a lot of people bringing cameras. Uh, the subways were a little bit crowded with people coming down here to take a look at what was the United States, one of the biggest stories in U.S. history. Uh, they don't want these kind of people here because you really can't get a good view. Uh, there are buildings in the way, and certainly police are keeping a lot of uh, all the people back, including the press at times. So don't come down here if you don't have any business. Joey. Richard, let me ask you about the scene as you've been able to see it behind you. I have read in some reports that 10,000 tons, maybe much more than that, have already been removed from the site. I'm wondering, as you look down from your uh, rooftop vantage point, whether you see that that is making much of a dent in the huge amount of rubble that is down below you. We don't have a clear view of the biggest mound of rubble, only we get reports. Uh, I spoke to two people who flew in on a, one of the first passenger jets out of Oakland, California last night. They flew over the World Trainer, Trade Center site, what used to be the Trade Center, as is customary of planes arriving at New York airports. They described a disastrous scene, uh, a lot of rubble, but they are making progress. Uh, I think it's around at least 20,000 tons have been removed so far, but we cannot see it from here, and a tourist or anyone who wants to come down here with a camera is certainly not going to see it. And that's why they caution these people to stay away. Absolutely. The work is hard enough without people getting in the way. CNN's Richard Roth joining us from our vantage point overlooking Lower Manhattan. Wolf? Joey, there were some key developments today involving the investigation, including news that two of the hijackers were under surveillance by U.S. intelligence. CNN's Eileen O'Connor joins us now with more on those developments. Eileen, tell us what you've learned. Well, Wolf, US, confi U.S. officials confirmed that U.S. intelligence had two of the men who hijacked a plane from Dulles Airport and crashed it into the Pentagon on a watch list. They informed the FBI that Khalid al mihar and Salim al-Hamzi were associated with Osama bin Laden. Why? Because one source says al-Khalid was captured on surveillance tape in Malaysia, meeting with the suspect in the bombing of the USS Cole. That's Khalid al midhar And despite that, all these men lived in San Diego, along with al-Hamzi's brother. According to a landlord there, they left at one point. Now, walk al-Hamzi telling his landlord he was now in Arizona. Another hijacker, Hani Hanjour, lived in Phoenix and received flight training at a flight school there. Now, it's unclear whether al-Khalid and the other al-Hamzi brothers ever received flight training there as well, but they did attend a community college in San Diego. And the Justice Department says that 25 people have now been detained on possible INS visa violations. Law enforcement sources have also widened the watch list and are keep currently keeping a lid on that master list, giving it out pretty much to law enforcement authorities only. But they may be releasing some of that information, even to the public in the next few days, to try to apprehend people, according to sources. Now, people will be apprehended as material witnesses. That means, though, that some are very likely to be cleared. Two, two individual sources say have been detained for immigration issues. They are Mohammed Jawid Asmath and Ayub Ali Khan. They are being transported to New York for questioning. The two had tickets on a flight from Newark to San Antonio. That flight was diverted to St. Louis when the hijackings began. The two then took a train bound for San Antonio, but they were taken off the train in Dallas. Authorities say they possess box cutters, which investigative sources say the hijackers use to take control of at least one of the planes. While it could be a coincidence, sources say there are other reasons these two men attracted their attention. Meanwhile, a man arrested under a material witness warrant remains in custody. His information in New York, sources say, is moving this investigation forward. Sources say there could be two more cells or groups of terrorists still at large. Sources say dozens of material witness warrants are likely to be served in the next few days on individuals around the country. Many of these may have information, others may not. Now, also, law enforcement sources are telling us that people on this watch list that's sought by investigators, they share some common characteristics. They're looking for men or women in their early 20s of Middle Eastern citizenship, 
predominantly with Saudi Arabian passports, then they have no U.S. residency. They're clean-shaven with a Western appearance. They have pilot licenses or are familiar with planes, with visas designating them as students. And they're using names at times similar to the hijackers. Now, the use of all these similar names, Wolf, and possibly the use of stolen names has frustrated this investigation at every turning point, law enforcement sources say. Wolf? So, Eileen, I know you've do been doing some excellent reporting on all of this. How close do the investigators, the law enforcement authorities, the FBI and the others, how close do they believe they are to wrapping up this plot involving these four airliners and you say a couple other cells may still be at large? How close do they think they are to wrapping it all up? They're not close at all, Wolf. Uh, this is going to take uh, months and years. They're reassessing. Uh, all of the information about all terrorist acts going back even into the early 1980s. They're looking at links from this action to terrorist groups that were involved in actions in Beirut, in Lebanon. You remember, Wolf, the uh, car bombing of the Marine Embassy there. Also, to the USS Cole, as these two men were associated with that attack. Also, to other, the last attempt on the World Trade Center. Every single terrorist act in the last uh, 20 years is being reassessed. Testimony and cases, everything is being looked at against. All the intelligence out there. Well, so, so are they assuming it's not necessarily simply uh, the Osama bin Laden organization known as Al-Qaeda, but other uh, groups that are uh, terrorist in their orientation may be associated? There may be a much broader plot here? Absolutely. They're looking at what really is a confederation, if you will, of a lot of small groups. Uh, groups that have uh, some ties in Pakistan, the groups, of course, associated with Osama bin Laden, and also they're looking at Algerians, they're looking uh, perhaps to even some links to Chechnya, uh, they're also looking to links to people associated with actions out of Lebanon. This is a broad, broad network, and this took a lot of planning and a lot of determination, and that is what is really frightening to law enforcement officials. Well, so I assume, Eileen, they're also looking at some states that may be involved in this, some governments that may be sponsoring or aiding, harboring these kinds of terror organizations. They are, and they're also going to be putting pressure on governments that have been reluctant to be involved in these investigations before to really come up with the goods and push hard on some of their individuals and citizens now. Well, so the investigation, according to Eileen O'Connor, is just beginning. Thank you very much, Eileen. Uh, let's go back to Joey. Well, if another urgent issue on the mind of the nation's leader, what effect all this will have on the economy? The ripple effect of Tuesday's disaster is now being felt in the airline industry. Continental Airlines today said it is putting on furlough 12,000 employees. Earlier in the week, you will recall Midway Airlines said it would stop its operations. Both carriers acting out of concern that the attacks would lead to slowdowns in the industry and in the economy as a whole. Looking at the nation's airports for signs that the country is ready to take to the air again, CNN's Kathleen Koch is at Reagan National Airport. Kathleen. Joey, this is the one and only airport that remains closed within the United States, but you may see planes moving behind me because the Department of Transportation decided just this afternoon that they would let somewhat more than 120 aircraft, which were stranded here on Tuesday when the skies were shut down, they would give those aircraft a chance to take off and get back into circulation. Now, Joey, this, is, this does not change the fact that this airport remains temporarily closed indefinitely because the FAA still has a lot of concerns about its proximity to the nation's capital to vital buildings like the White House, uh, the Capitol, to, of course, the Pentagon. Now, as you pointed out, we are already seeing a toll being taken within the airline industry by the terrorist attacks on Tuesday. There was a press conference this afternoon where uh, the CEO and chairman of Continental Airlines announced not only the furloughing of those 12,000 employees, but also the fact that they were going to be reducing their long-term flight schedule by 20 percent. And Gordon Methune issued a plea to the federal government. I now and we all of us call on the President of the United States and members of our Congress to take immediate action to restore the stability of this vital industry on which our whole nation's economy heavily depends. Our industry needs direct and immediate government-sponsored liquidity and aid if we, and a vital part of our economy, are to survive. 
CNN has checked in with numerous airlines throughout the day, and they are reporting that they are struggling to get all their flights in the air. As we go down the list, American Airlines said that it hoped to get about 50 percent of its flights out today. Continental, 55 percent. Delta Airlines, 60 percent. Northwest Airlines was shooting for 50 percent, and United Airlines had a goal of just 21 percent. So, uh, Joey, as you can see, it's cl clearly going to be a pretty significant amount of time be before the nation's skies do get back to normal and air traffic gets rolling. And Kathleen, in addition to the sort of security delays that we have all heard uh, warned about that we should anticipate for anyone who is going to any airport in the United States, keeping Reagan National closed at this point, does that also contribute to the delays in that uh, airplanes cannot land there or take off from there? That's a big chunk of the airline system that's taken out. It really does mean that, Joey, especially for the nearby airports, Dulles International Airport in Virginia and Baltimore Washington International Airport, which is between Washington, D.C. and Baltimore, you are going to obviously see, obviously see a great increase in traffic at those airports. And anyone wanting to fly into this area is going to have to go to those two airports. So that will definitely uh, lead to a greater backlog. CNN's Kathleen Koch out at Reagan National Airport, also in the nation's capital, Wolf. Joey, uh, thank you. An attempt to lessen the impact on the nation's air carriers has already reached Capitol Hill. On what lawmakers are considering for the nation's ailing economy, your CNN's congressional correspondent Kate Snow. She's standing by. Kate, what is going on on the Hill in order to help the airline industry? Well, this morning at about 2 o'clock in the morning, Wolf, the House of Representatives was still hard at work here. They were trying to take up this airline measure. They had introduced a measure that would provide $2.5 billion in direct cash payments to the airline industry and then another additional $12.5 billion in loan assurances, loan guarantees for the airlines. Now that bill at 2 in the morning this morning did not pass the House of Representatives. Why? Because there were many members who felt that it was unfair to single out the airline industry. They asked on the House floor, what about the financial industry? What about tourism? What about insurance companies? Just to name a few others that are expected to suffer great losses. House Democratic leader Dick Gephardt said he expects they're going to take up the airline industry measure again next week. Gephardt this afternoon sat down with some of his colleagues in a rare Saturday afternoon meeting inside the Capitol. Our cameras were allowed inside for just a few moments of that meeting. They were talking about the economy more generally and about the airlines. Uh, they were talking about Congress trying to send a signal both to Americans and to Wall Street when Wall Street reopens for business on Monday that Congress is ready to do something to help bolster the economy. Mr. Gephardt saying Congress has a big role to play in telling consumers to be confident. We've got to give people confidence to go back out and go to work, buy things, go back to the stores, get ready for Thanksgiving, get ready for Christmas, uh, get out and, and be active, participate in our society. Now, Republicans have been singing the same tune. They are also talking about ways to stimulate the economy. Uh, it should be noted that Democrats and Republicans do have a little bit of a different idea about how that could be done. Republicans very much focused on capital gains tax reductions and other business tax reductions. Mr. Gephardt suggesting today that he might look at that rebate check that every American has just gotten in the mail, maybe sending out another rebate check. So, Wolf, a lot of discussion going on next week when Congress returns here. I'm told by Democrats that every Everything will be on the table, and they hope to work with their Republican counterparts to get some sort of stimulus package through this Congress. Well, Kate Snow on Capitol Hill, thank you very much. Joey? All right. Uh, on the issue of whether rescuers are able to work through their emotions, the man who runs the nation's emergency agency, the Federal Emergency Management Agency, Joe Alba, speaking just a few minutes ago with reporters near the Pentagon, talking about the efforts there, the grim work that is underway at the Pentagon, the nation's head military fortress. It has been a very difficult task, as Joe Alba noted just a few minutes ago. With them. These are American heroes, let me tell you. I'm not sure that I could do what they do. It takes a unique individual, men and women alike, working shoulder to shoulder to go inside with their dogs. They live with their dogs, they sleep with their dogs, they bathe with their dogs. They have the, the best technical equipment that is available to, to find individuals to work their way through this problem. It is amazing. These are true Americans. We all ought to be proud of them. You see a law enforcement officer, you see a firefighter, you ought to stop them and thank them for what they do. They put their lives on the line every day. 
and yet they're always the first in line for budget cuts and the last in line for recognition. That's got to stop. These people are American heroes, and we ought to thank every one of them. It's amazing. Joe Albaugh echoing the sentiments that a lot of folks are feeling today. I don't know if you could tell from looking at him on videotape, but Joe Albaugh is a very big, strong man. He's a man with a great deal of emotion today about his, what is happening at the Pentagon site. We have seen so much of what is going on at the World Trade Center site. It's a little bit harder to tell at the Pentagon. But again, he is noting that we should all recognize the heroism of the folks who are working so hard to pick through that rubble. As we continue to talk about the losses, America's planes returned to the skies today, and New York began the bitter task of burying its dead. Manhattan firefighters, you see, paying final respects to some 